Hi, everyone. I'm Henry DeVries. Welcome to the Marketing with a Book podcast. So I run a company called Indie Books International. We work with the ABC, agency owners, business coaches, and consultants who want to find new clients by marketing with a book and a speech. And we have just one of those people with us today, a very special one, Dr. Carrie Johansson, author of the book, Self-Help on the Go. How are you today, Dr. Kerry? Hi, Henry. I'm great today. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much for joining us. Our, our topic today, we call it uh, how to manage client emotions. It's really about therapy for non-therapists. <laughs> what I hear regularly from the agency owners and the business coaches and the consultants is, is sometimes we have to be like therapists to our clients and mm -hmm. we're not trained therapists. Uh, and I'm not talking about their personal problems, their marital problems or financial problems or things like that. But for a business owner, a solopreneur or a small business owner, this is so personal and it's so important to them. And uh, fear enters into the picture. We like to say here, fear never sleeps. So would love to get some tips from you on how these non-therapists can apply some therapy skills. Absolutely. And part of it is managing people's emotions, because when people's emotions are heightened and really strong, they tend to sort of spill verbally. And then if you're on the receiving end of that and don't have good training, it can feel really overwhelming really quickly. It feels like today, and please verify this, or if you disagree, tell me, but the automatic go-to position for clients are, well, you're wrong. It doesn't matter that we had an agreement or an expectation, but you're always the, the other people are the wrong people. Do you feel that way? Absolutely. And it's been something that I've been talking a ton about, especially in the last several years, is we are really facilitating on a very grand scale, particularly in the United States. I can't speak to how this is playing out across the world, but particularly in the United States, we've really gotten into what I call victim culture. And victim culture externalizes responsibility and sort of throws responsibility onto anyone except for the person who's doing the throwing. And, um, and it's, it's sort of shocking sometimes. It's also very frustrating. And frequently, it doesn't feel very fair. So Henry, one of the things you talked about is, but I had a written contract. It's all spelled out, ABC, it should be clear. And the client will come back and say, well, I saw that, but I thought you meant this. Or I saw that, but I still had this expectation. And so that lack of clarity combined with that externalizing of responsibility can really feel very like big in the moment and also can sometimes cost you relationships and cost you deals in ways that feel confusing and upsetting. Yeah. We want to maintain rapport with our clients. Mm -hmm. And we want to help them get what they signed up for us with. And I think I'm speaking for all consultants and yeah. service providers. Um, but sometimes people justify their actions. Uh, how is that working in their mind? Well, oftentimes it's guided by fear. So if you're afraid, particularly if you're afraid that you've lost something or that you've done something wrong, it's a lot easier to pick on someone else than it is to, to look at yourself and to look at your ownership and responsibility in a scenario. The interesting and kind of paradoxical thing here, though, is that the more ownership you're taking on what is actually yours, the more power you have to move forward in positive directions and to fix mistakes. So one of the things that I like to talk to folks about is that if you can set up a culture and a value-based system before you end up in a problem. So part of that is writing the contract, right? But right. another piece of that is taking the contract and then marrying it with the values that you're trying to impart to your client so that then you guys can collaborate together. So that might look like a conversation that says, here's our contract. Now let's go through it and understand that the main principle I'm looking for here is that I really wanna take charge of my end of things. 
I really want you to take charge of your end of things. That's an ownership conversation where you're inviting them to take ownership of their piece. And you're also clarifying what you're willing to own and what you're not willing to own. One mentor taught me years ago on agreements is to not accept money until you have that detailed conversation. The client might say, yes, I agree. The money's right. Everything's good. And in the old days, we were actually physically meeting at a conference table. We never right. do that now. It's all online. But we physically met at a conference table. And I would not physically touch their check until mm -hmm. we had that conversation. Mm -hmm. That seems in this online world to have slipped by, but what I'm hearing you say is we need to have those conversations, even if at that point the client just wants to get working, wants to get going, they're in a hurry to get going. Is absolutely. Okay. Yep, absolutely. And you know how you used to be able to do nonverbals, such as waiting to take their check, until you had gotten clarity around your agreement, ending the conversation with a handshake. A handshake used to actually signify a sealing of an agreement. So we now need to figure out how to virtually do those nonverbal pieces, like not taking the check, but now you have to actually say it out loud instead of assuming that it's true. It's really interesting. We mostly know ourselves as individuals from our covert thoughts. So we understand what's going on inside our heads. Unfortunately, that's actually covert. What is overt is our expressions, our tone of voice, our what we actually, you know, the words that actually come out of our mouth, as well as what shows in our nonverbals, what shows even how we walk into a room. And so we've really cut down on our ability to make some of those nonverbal pieces of communication overt. And we're now kind of leaning on some assumptions and assumptions are very dangerous to make business agreements with because if it is not overt, then you really actually don't know what someone else has agreed to. And they also don't know what your intentions are. So true. We also know that clients don't read the details of a contract. No. <laughs> um, yeah, nope. there's even, uh, and I don't mean we're doing six point mouse type or that thing that before you can accept the $2.99 uh, $2 software or app that you have to agree to this terms of uh, these long lengthy terms that we all just go click. Yeah, okay, fine. I mean, it could say Bill Gates is legally uh, able to come into your house and take your furniture. I mean, we, we don't right. know what we're signing there. I I'm talking something that's just more basic than that, that they don't sign. Um, so are there any other techniques you have to avoid these negative client emotions that can come into play when fear gets involved? We say fear never sleeps, so we know fear is coming. Right. And excitement is often the thing that trips people up when they're making an agreement. They're excited and they're eager to get going. Therefore, it's like, let's go. And then later they read the contract and go, oh, oh, did I mean to agree to that? Right. Yeah. So that excitement is the initial emotion that actually needs to be managed. And you can do that even by saying something like, I know you're really excited and we are awesome to work with. So of course you should be excited, right? Um, but, and let's, and, and let's take a look at the details. So it, guiding them through in a way that you used to be able to do in a conference room, now you can do it online, but you just have to spell it out a little bit more. So managing the initial excitement of somebody who's eager and ready and maybe even impatience, right? Like, no, no, I don't need to worry about the details. I'm ready to work and label it, right? I know you're ready to work and let's make sure to go over the details. So we're clear on what, on what's mine and what's yours and how this, and how this unfolds over time. Now we've talked about fear. And when there's a back and forth of work, something comes up 
uh, Mark LeBlanc talks about it in his work about the perfection trap and the comparison trap. Mm -hmm. They might be uh, in, in the book publishing world, they might hold themselves up to this perfection standard that their book has to be perfect. Um, I think worse than that is the comparison trap where I've had people say, well, it's not as good as good to great. It's not as good as eat, pray, love. Right. Uh, this is, well, yes, it's, there are 32 million books on Amazon and those are multi-million bestsellers, um, but somehow in their mind that stops them. And we don't know how to bring up, well, there's something called the good enough point or mm -hmm. uh, you know, good to great. We just, could your book just be great, but doesn't have to be the greatest book of all time? Um, but in your practice, and I know you give these hacks and tips and tricks for people to manage their own emotions, but what can we do to help people manage those emotions as they're happening? Well, I think part of it is understanding that there's a couple of different types of fear that come up. And one of the biggest fears that underlines underlines human performance is the fear of I'm not good enough, right? And that shatters in the back of people's minds in all sorts of different ways. It can be as obvious as I'm not good enough. It can also be I'm not as good as Brene Brown or Eat, Pray, Love or Good to Great. And so just knowing and understanding that that might be a piece of what you're dealing with. And then there's acute fear, which is when someone's missed a deadline or they feel like something isn't going the right way, then that's going to be a spikier emotion to deal with. And that often comes out like anger. And if you can get to the fear underneath, like, so what are you worried about? What's, what's the thing that you're concerned about? If you can get underneath the anger in that initial lash out reaction, that can get you some really good traction. And if you've started by understanding, they might have a general fear of like, like how many people blow through their deadlines with you, Henry, right? Like, because they get anxious about the product and the next thing you know, they <laughs> it's two weeks late and you're sending them an email going, hi, I, you know, I thought we had an agreement for it to be turned in on October 1st. Where are you? Um, mostly, I would guess that many times, if not most of the time, that's driven by that underlying foundational fear of I'm not good enough. Thank you. It's not something they say. No. Uh, it's, but to your point, we have to understand that it's there somewhere and, um, and respond in a kind manner and uh, give people outs and all that. Um, in other fields like financial services, when you're talking about money, people can be very fearful and anxious. And um, yes. one uh, author used to call it head trash. They have a lot of head trash when it comes to money. <laughs> um, what's been your experience in helping people in those realms? Well, I think people get a lot of head trash in certain areas. So finances is a great one to get a head trash about. Appearance is another one to get head trash about, both how do you look personally and then how does your product look out in the world? Um, and then people get head trash from old things, right? Like if they were told when they were young that they weren't very smart, you'll hear that in conversation. Like, well, you know, I'm not the smartest guy in the room, but blah, blah, blah. That's actually a window into their head trash. Wow, that's interesting because yeah, that's um, that opens up a lot of things because people give you those clues. Yep. They, as you said, they'll they'll bring it out somehow. Do we go to that person and say, um, I'm sorry, I'm a little confused because you're very smart. You're one of the smartest people, you know, we've worked with. If that's honest and sincere, mm -hmm. if they're dumb as a post, of course, we wouldn't say that. <laughs> but, uh, you know, or if, um, oh, the thing about attractiveness, we get that a lot because there's pictures on the back of the book. There's pictures yeah. on the website. We have to do a podcast. A um, lot of anxiety comes out over personal image. Well, what can we do to help them through that? Well, I think a piece of it is, is saying it out loud without trying to solve the problem, right? Like that's my job as the psychologist is to actually help a client come in and solve the problem of the various and sundry head trash, right? If they're terribly insecure about their looks, that would be my job to help them solve that problem. 
your job is to help them feel more comfortable about it without trying to solve the problem. So that might look like lots of people feel anxious about their pictures. And here are some of the ways that we've had folks feel most comfortable about their picture. And to use some of that softened language. So like uh, you're not looking for the perfect picture. You're looking for a picture that you feel comfortable with or a picture that communicates the story that you wanna tell with your book. So instead of your appearance has to be perfect or you have to look pretty or beautiful for women or you have to look wise for men, those are typically sort of the ways those head trash plays out in gender specific ways. Um, but so using some of that softer language around being comfortable, being good enough, getting to 80% uh, instead of 100%, those are all ways to soften those problems without you taking on the obligation of solving those problems. I think that's great. We, <clears throat> we have to help them through their challenges. We don't solve their challenges. Mm -hmm. um, so going from there, any specific tips about talking about money? Because we talked about head trash and people are very sensitive. Um, one client invited me to their home so their office was in their home and they had a home office and she has a she had a couch and she was sitting i was in a chair she was sitting at the end of the couch next to me um, she initiated the conversation about money a half an hour in she was all the way at the other end of the couch her <laughs> knees were pulled up and hold and I thought, okay, I'm not a therapist, but that looks like the fetal position. Uh huh. This um, looks like a trauma response. Yes. Oh my god. <laughs> uh oh. What have I triggered here? So, any tips we have for dealing with conversations about money? Well, I think a piece of it is going into most conversations about money, understanding that people get squirrely really fast when they're talking about money. They're insecurities come up quickly, their bravado comes up quickly. I mean, I know we're talking a lot about fear, but sometimes fear manifests as this big puffed up chest kind of presentation <laughs> instead of the like, oh no, am I good enough presentation? Um, so just starting from a platform of understanding that people struggle talking about money. And as soon as you see the struggle is trying to label it and maybe even labeling it before you start. I know talking about finances can be intimidating, or I know talking about the financial piece of this might not be your favorite. Something that is sort of a lead in to a common ground where you can both agree that talking about the finances might be tricky. And then from there, when you see something, especially if you're getting to watch some of those nonverbals, like that client was giving you a ton of overt information, the finances were very difficult for them to talk about. So as soon as you notice some of those, uh, you know, all of a sudden their posture is they're backing up, <laughs> right? Or they're starting to get red or sweat or they get defensive. It's like, then bringing it back to, I know talking about finances is hard, and this is a critical piece for us to make a great relationship. So talking about the benefit to working through the financial piece of things sometimes is a great way to help with that. Um, are there other sort of specific scenarios that I could deconstruct for you? Well, those were great. Uh, when you're a business coach, talking about the numbers, Mm -hmm. and um, the numbers and the money and sometimes the defense that people throw out is, oh, well, this is not all about the money. I, I'm not about the money. Mm -hmm. I'm about helping people. This is about, you know, having more impact and influence um, and having to bring up that, well, if you don't get the money right, mm -hmm. you're not going to be around to have impact and influence. Exactly. So, any strategies when it's about that? Well, this is where I like using a strategy that I call both and communication. And this is where you're essentially helping someone accept that reality is on board with their life, right? So they have their life that they're intending and they're interested in and they want it to go a certain way. And then reality comes in and brings them sometimes something different. So 
as you're talking to somebody particularly about money and they start getting that kind of defensive posture of like, oh no, I don't, you know, I'm about helping people. It's not about the money. You can essentially say what you just said, which is, well, if we do the money well, then you can help people more. So let's dig into the money side of things. That's that both and thinking. You want this and we're going to put this in play too. We do both. Sounds very much like the rules of improv. Yes, and. Yes. Uh, we don't, we don't <laughs> totally immediately push right. back. And what about when you have to push back? What are ways that you can tell people that um, I, there's a different look on that? There's a different view on that. Uh, maybe you're looking at that incorrectly. These are not the phrases I want to use, but I just wanted to give you the feeling that's behind these phrases that the coach or consultant is trying to use with the client. I actually really like that uh, phrase of let's take a different look at this, or there's a different look to this. Let's take a look at multiple perspectives. One of my favorite questions to ask is what do you see are the pros, the cons, and then what are the unintended consequences, either positive or negative? So it forces someone to get outside of just that emotional response and get into an analysis. So if you're in an analysis, then emotions tend to be better regulated. If you're just in an emotional response, that's fun if somebody's happy, but it's not really very fun at all to deal with, especially if somebody's super scared or super mad. We're really benefiting from your 20 years of therapy <laughs> and I mean, being a therapist. Um, before we go, are there any other tips that are coming to mind you wanted to be sure to share? I think just in general, that notion of Accepting reality does not mean that you approve of it. And I think that this is a piece of why we've gotten victim cult, why victim culture has gotten so loud is this idea that if we acknowledge that there's conflict in the world, if we acknowledge that things aren't perfect, if we acknowledge that we personally aren't perfect, that then immediately means that we're bad. That's actually resisting reality. And anytime you're resisting reality, it makes your life harder and way less fun. So if you're in a place where you can talk about and acknowledge, well, this is what's really happening and this is where it feels comfortable and this is where it doesn't feel comfortable. If you can model some of that for your clients and then you can ask them to return that favor when you're in conversations, I think it's going to really soften things for you and help get you into that ownership mode and out of that victim mode. Thank you. You wanted to offer a special gift to the listeners of the podcast. Would you I share that? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so two special offers. One is that my book, Self Help on the Go, the Kindle version is on a 15% off sale on Amazon. So Self Help on the Go, 15% off Kindle. And then for anybody who's listening who would like a free 20-minute strategy session with me, go to my website, which is Self Help on the go.com fill out the contact form and in the subject line just put henry's interview and i would happily give you a 20 minute block of time just to do a strategy session and see see if there might be some ways that i can give you some specific tips to help you manage your clients emotions and move forward two generous offers you are relentlessly helpful doctor <laughs> it's so great to have you on uh, Thanks, Henry. Thank you so much for your time today and sharing this. And I look forward to having more information on this. I think it's a real issue. I hear it a lot when I talk to consultants and agency owners that uh, this is something we weren't trained to do and we need to do better. And books like yours and advice from people like you are so helpful in this. Thank you so much. And that concludes our Marketing with a Book podcast for this week. We look forward to seeing you on a future episode. Bye, everybody.